Nehemiah said, fight for your brothers and fight for your sons and fight for your daughters and fight for your wives and fight for your houses. There are some things that are still worth fighting for. Did you hear what I said? There are some things that are still worth fighting for. There are some things that God demands that you fight for. There are some things that God expects you to fight for. There are some things that you're going to lose if you choose to be a pacifist and sit back and do nothing about it. Our government was shut down for 35 days. Did anybody notice? That, that was the longest government shut down in U.S. history, and there's still a possibility to tell us that it'll shut down again in a couple of weeks. But the shutdown lasted long enough that a lot of Americans were finally able to understand what a government shutdown means. You see, I'm like a lot of you. I used to, to believe that when the government shut down, that everybody in government, everybody's office in government were closed. You know, I, I thought that it meant the congressmen and senators and even the president had to stop working because there wasn't enough money to keep things going in the government. I even thought that it might be a good idea for the government to shut down because then we'd find out that as a nation we can function a whole lot better without lying politicians making decisions for us and telling us what to do with our money and what to do with our families. But America is learning, I'm learning, that when the government shuts down, all of the people in charge still get a paycheck. It's everybody else that's out of a job. The main point of the conflict has been, and still is, whether or not to fund the building of a wall on the southern border of the United States. I've never seen so much fuss over a wall, have you? Uh, it, the closest thing I've seen to it is when my wife decided to paint the living room wall and took the paint back three times. <laughs> I haven't been to the border in recent years, and I'd, I'd venture to say that neither have you. I, I haven't spoken to any of the people who work there, and you probably haven't either. The only thing that we know about, about it is what we see on the news, which we all know is highly accurate, bipartisan, and fair. <laughs> and yet everybody has an opinion. Many people have a strong opinion. Some people think that a wall is a necessity. Other people say that it isn't needed. Some have said that having a wall is immoral and inhumane. I've even heard people say that it's unchristian to have a wall because Jesus accepts everybody. And then somebody else points out that heaven has walls and a gate, but the path to hell is wide and open. But the one thing I have noticed is nobody is talking to the people who are trying to secure the border. But nobody's asking them if we should have a wall. We all know that, what the politicians think, but nobody's asking the people who are dealing with, uh, with it every day if they think it would help them do their job. We went to Disney World a few years ago, and there were tens of thousands of good people, families, Moms and dads, innocent children trying to get in. But Disney had the audacity to make us all enter through a gate and buy a ticket before we can enjoy our day. So, should we build a wall or not? Well, now I have your attention. You wonder where I'm going with this. You think I'm going to talk about a border wall. Well, I'm not. But I'm going to speak to you about a wall that is by far the most important and the most necessary wall that any man could build. I'm going to speak to you about a wall that is your responsibility and absolutely essential to your survival. God said in 1 Corinthians 1.21 that he's chosen the foolishness of preaching to save those who believe. There are a lot of people who think that what I do is foolishness. They think that it's ludicrous for people to come to church every Sunday morning and listen to a guy like me ramble on, and they consider it to be foolishness. But the Bible isn't saying that preaching is foolish. But it's saying that in the eyes of some men, the idea that someone can be changed by the power of the Word of God is considered foolishness. How can someone listen to a sermon and be transformed into a new person? How can someone hear a message and suddenly be free from their past and given a new start in life? That's just crazy. But I like how God concludes this matter on foolish preaching. Verse 25 says that the foolishness of God is wiser than men and that the weakness of God is stronger than men. The author isn't suggesting that God has foolishness or God has weakness, but instead he's making the argument that we ought not to look to what man considers to be wise and to be strong since the power of God is misidentified by these individuals to be foolishness. 
What I'm telling you is that you might not understand how preaching can accomplish anything. It might not make any sense to you, and you might think that it's crazy, but God says that it works. Some believe that a little religion is all they need. When I was a young Christian, I believed that since I knelt at an altar one night, and asked God to save me, that was all I needed. I, I went to the altar on that night of revival, and I prayed a prayer, and so I was saved. I had an experience. I had a spiritual encounter. From that point on, I figured that I was God's child, and he was obligated to take care of me. God would fill my needs, and he would heal my sickness, and he would protect me from my enemies. God would deliver me when I was in trouble, and no matter how I lived my life, I didn't have anything to be concerned about because I had that one time encounter. Some of you feel like that right now. You sit in church on Sunday morning, you carry your Bible under your arm. You say your prayers at night and you're convinced that you are invincible because God is on your side. But there's a valuable truth that you have to understand and that truth is God won't do anything for you that you can do for yourself. He won't fix anything that you can fix yourself. He won't clean up anything that you can clean up yourself. He won't pay for anything that you can pay for yourself. He won't heal anything that you can heal yourself. But God's power only steps in at the point of your limitation. Just maybe what you're dealing with right now is because of you. Nobody else's fault. It's a result of your bad decisions and your own negligence. The mess that you're in right now is a result of your sin and your disobedience to God. You haven't lived in righteousness, but you tried to live with one foot in the church and the other foot in the world, and now you have a mess. You cried and you prayed and you're waiting for God to step in and miraculously clean up your mess, but God's telling you, I'm not going to raise a finger to help you until you do what you can do first. When the children of Israel were wandering in the wilderness, God fed them every day with manna from heaven. But when they stepped into the promised land, the manna stopped, and they had to feed themselves. God won't feed you when you can feed yourself. He gave the Israelites the promised land, but they still had to fight for it and take it from their enemies. Having the presence of, your God, of God is in, in your life isn't enough because there are some things that God requires for you to do for yourself. I know we've been told, just get saved and let God clean you up. But I'm here to tell you this morning that the first thing you need to do is make sure you're saved. One of the biggest fears I have as a pastor is to preach to a congregation Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, people who are hearing the word, who believe that some way, somehow, they're on their way to heaven, but they have never been saved because they don't understand the covenant of salvation. They're religious, they're faithful, but they're still lost. You need to know that you know your sins have been forgiven and that you've been washed clean by the blood of Christ. You need to know that the devil has been evicted from your life and that the Holy Spirit resides in your heart. And when you know that, then start cleaning yourself up. God isn't going to bathe you when you can bathe yourself. He's not going to dress you when you can dress yourself. He's not going to brush your teeth and comb your hair and tie your shoes when you can tie your own shoes. God isn't going to come into your house and clean out your closets and clean your drawers, but God will only step in when you've done everything that you can do for yourself. Listen to me. God isn't going to clean up your house. You need to clean up your own house. He's not going to protect your children if you're not doing all that you can do to protect your children. God is going to keep the enemy away if you keep inviting him in. There are some things that you have to do for yourself, and God will do nothing for you until you've done your part. Now, that's the introduction. This is the message. In the book of Ezra, Ezra the priest had gone back to Jerusalem, and he had rebuilt the temple. That was important to the Jews. The temple that Solomon had built had been destroyed by the Babylonians. 2 Kings 25 says, In the fifth month, uh, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord, the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. The temple had been destroyed. The temple wasn't only the center of their society, but it was a symbol of everything that they stood for as a people. So before they rebuilt anything else, listen to this, they built the church. Before anything else was paid for, they built the church. Before they wasted what they had on luxury and entertainment, they built the church. 
before they rebuilt their own homes, they built a church. Would to God that the church would be so important to his people today. But now the temple was built. The church was finished, but the city in which the church resided was still vulnerable because there was no fortification. There was no wall to protect the city from its enemies. So Jerusalem was open to to being destroyed again. And this is where Nehemiah came in. Nehemiah wasn't a priest. He wasn't a preacher. Nehemiah was a civil servant. He was cupbearer to King Artaxerxes of Persia. He's just a regular guy with a regular job. Nehemiah traveled to Jerusalem, and when he got there, he saw the city of peace. He saw the capital of God's people. And he saw the temple that Ezra had rebuilt. I'm sure the tears came into his eyes when he realized that God's people could go home and they could worship God there again. But then he saw the outer wall of the city in a state of disrepair. He saw the gates broken down and falling apart, and God laid a work on Nehemiah's heart. When you look at the church today, you see its ministries, the Sunday school, the children's church, the Bible school, the youth group. You see its missions, and you are moved with passion because of the work that God is doing. But then if you look around you and you'll notice how vulnerable its people still are, you'll see how vulnerable the community is, and you soon realize that the job isn't finished yet. And then God leaves a work on your heart. Don't think that you have to be a pastor or an elder to work in God's kingdom. There's a work that God's laying on you right now. What work is that? What is the Holy Spirit moving you to do? What is God showing you? How is he stirring you and convicting you? You might not be a preacher. You might just be an average man or woman with an average job and an average family, but God is moving you to do something. You see a need, and you're moved to do something about that need. You can't wait till other people see it, and you can't wait till it becomes a popular cause because God himself has shown you what needs to be done. The temple had been rebuilt, but the wall was in disrepair. You see, some people are convinced that as long as the church is okay, then everything else is okay. Some think that as long as God is blessing in the sanctuary, they have nothing to fear in their home. But I'm here to tell you, unless there is a wall, unless there is a wall to keep the devil out, unless there's a defense to keep Satan at bay, unless there is some homeland security standing between you and the enemy, Satan will waltz in and out and do whatever he pleases to whoever he wants to do it to whenever he so chooses. And when he has destroyed your home, he'll then come for the church. The Bible describes Satan as a liar and a murderer, a thief and a robber who prowls about seeking whom he may devour. He's our greatest enemy, but we've raised no wall of defense to keep him away. We need to respect the viciousness of our enemy. I was thinking this morning on my way to church, all of the attacks that Satan has placed on on, on my life, on Lisa and I's life over the years of our marriage. We've been in the ministry since the beginning, and I go back through my family and through our home and all of the things we've had to deal with. And I said, God, I hate Satan with a passion. He has done all of these things to us, and he never provides any relief. We need to respect how vicious he really is. He's the one who's terrorizing our nation. He's the one who's killing our children. He's the one who addicts and abuses and misuses. We need to despise who the devil is and what he stands for so much that even the mention of his name will make us want to rise up and fight. There are some things in this life that are worth fighting for, amen? Nehemiah said, fight for your brothers and fight for your sons and fight for your daughters and fight for your wives and fight for your houses. There are some things that are still worth fighting for. Did you hear what I said? There are some things that are still worth fighting for. There are some things that God demands that you fight for. There are some things that God expects you to fight for. There are some things that you're going to lose if you choose to be a pacifist and sit back and do nothing about it. There are times when God expects you to turn the other cheek. Oh, and that's hard to do. There are situations when God expects you to do nothing and walk away. That might be even harder. There are times when God expects you to be the peacemaker. And to be a peacemaker, you got to be in the middle of somebody's fight. But there are also times when God expects you to fight. Trouble is, there's no fight in some of us. We've allowed the devil the freedom to enter our homes whenever he chooses. He comes in over the TV set. He comes in over the Internet. He comes in by way of the bookstore. He comes in by way of the carryout. Do you hear what I'm telling you? God can't help you if you don't do something about it. Somebody posted on Facebook the other day that we need to pray that God takes the taste for alcohol and drugs out of our children's mouths. 
my wife, God bless her, commented in agreement. She said, then parents need to take it out of their refrigerators. I just wanted to write, boom. <laughs> I know I'll get to blame for it, but she wrote it. She said it. She, you get that on camera, she said it, okay? She said, I was just agreeing. And then whoever put it up took it down. <laughs> we've allowed Satan's access to our children because we've intentionally made ourselves vulnerable. We have no line of defense. We have no barrier to keep the devil away. Dad, you are the watchman over your home and over your children. Mom, you are the shelter for your offspring, and yet moms and dads intentionally have weakened themselves with the vices that the devil's given them, and they're in no condition to do their job. The guard is drunk, the sentry is high, the watchman's missing from his post because he's out on the town, and the children become easy prey. Some pa parents are so preoccupied with themselves that they give no thought to their kids. They don't supervise where they go. They don't investigate who they're with. They don't scrutinize what they're doing. Let me tell you, kids are growing up different than what I did. How many, how many of you remember your, your mom and dad had eyes everywhere, everywhere. My mom and dad, I could do it in the dark, in a closet, alone, 400 miles from home, and I'd walk through the door, mom go, what you been doing? Some parents are so preoccupied that they don't supervise their kids. They don't scrutinize what they're doing. Some parents make the excuse, well, I did things when I was their age. What can I say? You can say no. You can say no. It doesn't make it easy for your child to do the wrong things. They might tell you that they hate you. They might badmouth you to their friends. They might call you a religious fanatic and a Jesus freak. They might tell you that you just don't want them to have any fun. They might try to pressure you by telling you that all of their friends are doing it, but don't you dare give up any ground. They're your kids. Well, preacher, I don't want to fight and argue all the time. Let me tell you something. When they're closing the lid on the casket and they're lowering your child down into the ground, you give all that you have for one more chance to argue with them about what they wanted to do. Don't make it easy for your child to do wrong. Go home and build a wall. We need to raise a wall of defense between ourselves and the devil. We need to build a hedge of defense to protect our families. We need to lock the gates and stop up the holes and post armed guard of God's Holy Ghost. The church might be okay, but you're never going to be safe until you fortify a defense between you and the enemy. You have to build your wall. In chapter 3, when Nehemiah sent the people out to rebuild the wall, the Bible says every man worked on his own section of the fence. I like that. Everybody worked on his own section of the fence. God isn't going to build your wall. The preacher can't build your wall. Your grandma and grandpa can't build your wall. It is totally up, with, up to you. Do what you can do first. I'm not just talking about praying. See, some people are like, well, I'll pray about it. I'll say a little 30-second prayer while I'm laying in bed, falling asleep at night, and I'll tell God what needs to be done. I'll ask him to protect my family. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about making preparation and laying a firm foundation. I'm talking about throwing some things out. I'm talking about cleaning out some cupboards and emptying some shelves in the fridge. I'm talking about canceling a subscription or two. I'm talking about wiping out a directory or cleaning out a closet. I'm talking about rearranging your life and enduring change and inconvenience and paying the price and then going through your house with a bottle of anointing oil and anointing every doorway and every room and every TV set and every computer and every desk and every drawer and praying the power of the Holy Ghost down to build a hedge around your home so that the enemy that you just threw out can't get back in. Everybody was responsible to go out behind their own home and work on their own section of the wall that protected them. Now listen to this. Satan will only get to you where you let him in. He can only gain as much access to your home and your family as you permit him to have. You are responsible for your section of the wall. As the Israelites raised the wall, they didn't just do general construction. But when Nehemiah and God's people rebuilt the wall of Jerusalem, they not only laid up the wall and hung the main gates, but the Bible says that they also stopped up the breaches. Breaches are small holes, seemingly insignificant, unimportant holes, not big enough for an army to come through, but certainly large enough for one enemy to enter at a time. 
You see, in the culture, in our society today, we don't think that small holes are a big deal. Small holes are the things that deep down that we know are wrong, but we justify keeping them. They don't look like much, so instead of fixing them, we just set something in front of them. We hide them from the eyes of other people. There's a small hole in our wall, but nobody knows about it because it's just a little thing. The bottle in the fridge, small hole. The premium channel on our TV, small hole. The hangout you occasionally visit, small hole. The dangerous friendship that you keep, a small hole. You know what I'm talking about. Some have become so jaded that they brag about the hole in their wall. They feel that being open and honest is somehow freedom for them. They get together with other people who also have the same hole in their wall. And they have a block party and they celebrate their hole in the wall. Jesus said in Matthew 5, if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off because it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. We all know where the holes are in our wall. But instead of trying to fix those small holes, we try to disguise them. Some cover them up with breast spray and mouthwash. Some hide them with secret closets and hidden drawers. Some people pull the curtains and lock the doors. Some sneak out of town where nobody knows where they are, but most of us do it by making excuses. Now, before you go on, before I go on, let me say this. Listen close. The hole that you have in your wall is no better and no worse than the hole that somebody else has in their wall. The holes in my wall are no more excusable than the holes in your wall. And the holes in your wall are no more acceptable than mine. The shame and disgrace of having a hole in your wall of defense isn't that you have one. A lot of people have a hole in their wall. But the shame of it is when you know about it and refuse to do anything. It's one thing to build a wall and hang a gate, but it's a false sense of security if there's a hidden entrance. An unrepaired hole that gives access to the enemy. As long as there's a little hole in your wall, the devil will always have access to your life. As long as it exists, he'll have entrance to your family. As long as that hole exists, he'll have the freedom to come in and jeopardize your marriage. As long as that breach is there, he'll have the opportunity to capture your children. You have too much at stake here. You might not like any of this. You you might get mad and say that you're never coming back, but you know this is the word of God. It's time to take responsibility for your actions or your inaction and fix what you can fix on your own. You know where the holes are in your wall. You're not fooling anybody. You you know where the hole is. Your husband or wife knows where the hole is. Your kids know where the hole is. You know where the hole is in your wall. And as long as that hole exists, not only will Satan be able to get to you, but he'll also be able to attack those you love. Now, you can play the victim and say, why am I having trouble in my marriage? Why are my kids such a mess? Why is my life in such disarray? But you know why. You've kept the hole open for the devil to attack your marriage. You've shown your children the hole in the wall, and you've taught them how to use it. Don't call on God to deliver you from your troubles until you've done what you can do for yourself. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. You can't just say a little prayer and then stand back and watch God fix your wall. It's going to take time, and it's going to take hard work. You're going to be mocked and criticized. Your enemies will try to stop you. Your so-called friends will try to tell you that it's not necessary. But don't stop working until your wall is completely finished. Satan has enjoyed the freedom to mess up your life whenever he pleased. And there's nothing that upsets him more than when you make the decision that you're going to serve God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. It infuriates him when he goes to that hole that he's used time and time again and finds that it's been closed. In John 10.10, Jesus said, The thief comes not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Satan has three motives. To steal from you what God has blessed you with. To kill you in the process and then to destroy what you leave behind. But in that same passage, Jesus said, But I'm come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. There's something great that happens when the wall is built and the holes are finally closed. The key to the abundant life is the security of the Holy Spirit. 
when all of your sin has been purged from your life, when the wall has been built, when the gates have been hung and all of the holes have been repaired, that's when the true blessings come. Don't stop working until you're finished. There's some things in this life worth securing. There's some things worth fighting for. If you need an inspiration, take a good look at your wife or your husband. Take a good look at your children or your grandchildren and understand that the devil is salivating over them and find the inspiration and the passion that you need to finish this job. What are you passing on to those that come after you? But how do I build that wall? Where do I even begin? Building begins on your knees. Before you can ever build a strong wall, you have to have a strong foundation. So construction begins on your knees. It begins in prayer. Number one, it takes a prayer of repentance. It takes admitting to yourself and admitting to God that you know where your hall, wall is in disrepair. Confessing your sin and your shortcomings. There are no more secrets, no more lies, no more deception. When you confess your sins, the devil can't blackmail you with them anymore. Secondly, it takes a prayer of commitment, declaring to God that you're going to do all that you can do and you will fix whatever you can fix. It takes a vow to God that you're going to change your direction and change your attitude, not that you're going to try to change. That's just a promise to fail. But a declaration that you're going to change your life, period. No excuses, no loopholes, and no exceptions. And lastly, it takes a prayer of faith. Asking God to help you with the things that you can't do on your own. There are some things that you just can't do alone. Some of y'all are working on your holes in the wall. And you're doing the very best that you can do, but you can't do it on your own because they've been there a long time. And you need help. Building your wall of defense is a tough job, but if you trust God and you're sincerely trying to build that wall between your life and Satan, have faith that God will do for you the things that you cannot do for yourself. Building the wall begins on your knees. Before you can ever have a wall, the foundation has to be built first. To build the foundation over your wall, you have to kneel down and do the work that everything else is going to rest on. And that foundation has to be Jesus. It's not religion, it's not good works, it's not your own ideas, but on Christ alone. He is the rock, he is the firm foundation. It's been a long time since some of you have been on your knees. It's been a long time since some of you worked on your foundation. Let me encourage you today to take your husband or your wife by the hand, to gather your sons or daughters from wherever they're sitting and bring them down to the altar. Kneel together as a family and start working on the foundation of your wall. Pray the prayers of repentance and commitment and faith. And then get up from the altar and go home and start doing the work. Do what you can do first and build your walk. Well.